and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope the message you are about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on maybe a, a Tuesday afternoon or a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. That's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and help you take your next step, whatever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. No matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We are so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy this message. Joy is on the horizon. But what was on the horizon in the moments leading up to that first Easter? Against the sky brushed red by the morning twilight, the silhouette of the Son of Man hung on a Roman cross, betrayed crucified, mocked, insulted, abused by those he came to save. Many who put their faith in him lost all hope. The joy they found in their Messiah washed away, only able to lift their eyes far enough off the ground to see their Savior hanging helplessly, they hung their heads and turned away in disbelief. From noon until three, darkness came over all the land for the sun had stopped shining. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he had cried out again in a loud voice, he breathed his last. The earth shook and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. All those who knew him stood at a distance watching these things. It appeared the darkness had won. They took his body down off the cross, wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one which no one had yet been laid. A heavy stone was rolled in place to seal the entrance and they went away. On the morning of that very first Easter, uh, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus's body. On the morning of that very first Easter, these women were on their way to properly bury Jesus. Jesus who they'd seen teach, Jesus who they'd seen care for others, Jesus who they'd seal, seen heal others was now dead. And with him, so was their hope. On the morning of that very first Easter, these women uh, carry with them not just burial spices, but they carry with them their own shame and disillusionment and pain that this whole thing that they gave their lives to is over. On the morning of this very first Easter, as they walk to the tomb, these women carry with them all of this dread and all of this hurt of thinking about how am I going to restart my life now? Because everything that I had worked for and everything I'd sacrificed for and everything that I had trusted in is now gone. It all left one Friday afternoon. On the morning of that very first Easter, they had tunnel vision on their situation. But because of their love for Jesus, they were on their way to pay their final tribute to their dead friend. Their mind was consumed with what do we do now? How, who do we trust now? I'm telling you, that first Easter might be like this Easter for you. I know some of you have come to this moment and wonder, how do we recover when life gets dark? Right? What's in your sights when the night swallows the light? Like no matter how good you might have it in this moment, at some point in our life, you, you will have a, a dark moment. Like no matter how good life might be for you in this moment, we have this in common. You and I will both have terrible life-wrecking days in our life. Days we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy. It's a sudden death, a dream that's over, a marriage that will never be what it once was, a relationship that is completely severed, a consuming loneliness, 
A diagnosis you know means death. It could be an addiction, a miscarriage, a struggle, an anxiety, a depression, a loss. I'm telling you, at some point in your life, you you will have something in common with the first followers of Jesus because on that first Easter, their lives collided with darkness. They were drowning in the shallows of the unknown. Their life, life was dark. So where do you turn when your hopes crash and burn? How do you recover when life gets dark? Like, what do you put your hope in next so that you won't be crushed again? so that you'll never have to be defeated again. Like, what are you going to count on so that at the end of the day, you will still be standing, whether you get the job or not, whether you lose the weight or not, whether he cheats on you again or not, whether she's faithful as long as you both shall live or not. Where's your hope that you will still be standing? Like, what is it that you're trusting in that when life comes crashing down, you will be able to recover when life gets dark? Because the one thing that they knew that morning of that very first Easter is that Jesus was dead. They also knew real messiahs don't die. So when Jesus died, no one believed his message. When Jesus died, no one cared about all of the miracles that he had once done. When Jesus died, no one believed his claims. And like any other movement in history, when its leader died, when Jesus died, the movement that these ladies were a part of died with him. On the morning of that first Easter, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, uh, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. Mark continues, he says, very early. In their culture, very early meant 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. I don't know about you, but that seems very early to me. John adds this to detail, while it was still dark. So this was not just a statement about the position of the sun. This was a statement about the reality of their disappointment while it was still dark, while Jesus was still dead, while life still seemed hopeless. They were consumed by their situation and they couldn't see any way out of it while life was still dark. Those were the feelings that very first Easter. And maybe for you this Easter, it does feel like 3 a.m. in your life and you're kind of stumbling around in the dark. Maybe there's some parts of your life that feel buried or trapped, wondering if I'll ever be able to hope again. Will I get to experience lasting joy? If you've ever felt that way, you need to know the people that experienced the very first Easter could raise their hands and say, me too. You're not alone. Now, we don't normally think about it, but the very people who brought us the account of Jesus and the testimony of Easter present themselves as unbelieving bad friends of Jesus. Like they were so consumed with the difficulty of their life that they lost hope. And so so that means this, that if at one point in your life you trusted Jesus and at one point in your life you followed Jesus and at one point in your life you were known as somebody who depended on Jesus, but at some point along the way you may have fell away from Jesus, the people who bring us the story of Jesus could raise their hands and say, me too, you're not alone. But what we celebrate when we celebrate Easter is that God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. In fact, it's not even faith until your plan falls apart. It's not even faith till my plan falls apart. God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. So just to give a quick recap, Jesus has already been crucified. Two men, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, have already prepared the body for burial and they placed Jesus in a tomb. And the people in this account are so much like us because even though, even 2,000 years ago, the morning of that very first Easter, these women knew simply this, that if the men did it, if the men had prepared the body, then it probably needed to be redone. So that's why they're on their way to the tomb very early the first of the week, just after sunrise. They were on their way to the tomb. Now, this is a picture of a tomb, uh, tomb here in a second. It was common in Jesus' day. This is, the kind, this is the kind of stone that would have been used to seal the tomb. It had been around 2,500 pounds, and it would fit into this groove here. And to close the tomb, it only took a couple of people to roll that stone in place, but it would take several men or horses to remove it. Because once the stone was rolled into place, it would sink into the groove. So the morning of that first Easter, as they carried with them their oil and their spices, they also carried with them heartbreak. But one of the things they were carrying with them was a problem. Here's how they said it. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? So all they knew is there's an obstacle in their life and they don't know what to do with it. They had tunnel vision on their problem. All they know is there's an obstacle between me and and Jesus. But when they looked up, 
right? When they changed their perspective, when they focused on the horizon, when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now, this is important if you're skeptical. Not one of those ladies yelled out, resurrection, (laughs) not one of them. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man. Matthew tells us that that young man was an angel dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, uh, and they were alarmed, which I think is a big understatement in scripture. Like, I need to change my robe. Like, don't be alarmed. But, he, but the angel's like just sitting in this, on, in, in, the, in this tomb where they expected to see a dead body. And the angel's like, there's nothing to see here. We're, we're all good. Don't be alarmed. But don't miss this. The ladies that day, that very first Easter, came to perform a ritual but they were about to experience a miracle. Some of you came to church this Easter Sunday to perform a ritual, Christmas and Easter, Christmas and Easter. I'm glad you're here, Christmas and Easter. Some of you came to perform a ritual, but but we've been praying that you would experience a miracle in your heart today. They came to the tomb carrying with them their oil and spices to properly close out this ending. They were in the middle of a ritual, but God included them in this miracle because the angels said, do not be alarmed, he said, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. And then he says these amazing words. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where we laid him? But then he gives them instructions. Go and tell the disciples. Now, this is a very important detail, especially if you're on the edges of faith. Because in the first century, women had no credibility in the legal system. In the first century, women were not allowed to testify in court. Jesus always elevated the view and value of women, even when in their culture, they were unreliable. In fact, if it was possible for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to somehow tell the story of Jesus raising from the dead and not include this woman, they would have done it. But they included them, why? Because that's how it happened. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John talking about himself in the third person. I think we all know somebody like that, right? And they, they talk, they've taken the Lord, they said, out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Now don't, don't miss this. Mary, Mary doesn't come running up to the disciples saying, he is risen. Now, she didn't say that. She didn't say that he's resurrected. Why? Here's the reason. Nobody expected nobody. No one was standing outside the tomb that first Easter yelling, 10, 9, 8, like resurrection, like nobody was expecting nobody. And the people who give us the account of the the resurrection sheepishly, but honestly admit that we were so consumed with the thought that we had tunnel vision on the, uh, the idea that when Jesus died, he would stay dead. Now, Luke gives us this detail that when the ladies come to the disciples said, we did not believe the women because their words seem to like, what guys? Nonsense, guys. You know what that means? That's been happening for over 2,000 years. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, so when they, these ladies come, come to the guys and they're like, hey, yell. And it's like, hey, this is happening. And they're going crazy. And the, the guys are thinking, hey, you went to the wrong tomb. No wonder they don't allow women to testify in court. But John says this, so Peter and the other disciple, John talking about himself in the third person again, started for the tomb, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter, humble brag, and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Do you know why I think John didn't go in? (laughs) Because it was a tomb, right? It was scary. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and fitting his personality, he goes straight into the middle of the tomb and he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus's head. And and finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first saw and went inside. So he saw when he changed his perspective, when he focused on the horizon, when he looked in the right direction, when he saw and after he saw, what did he do? He believed. And I love this. Like, do you know when John, who spent three years following Jesus, when he finally believed? It wasn't the teaching, and it wasn't the parables, and it wasn't the miracles, and it wasn't the crucifixion. It was the empty tomb. If you follow Jesus, you need to know this. The foundation of our faith, the starting point of our faith is the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. That what we celebrate when we celebrate Easter is simply this. God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. That means that when you and I get depressed and hurting and broken and lost, Jesus came to rescue us. Jesus says it this way, for the son of man, that's what he called himself, came to seek and to save what was lost. 
I don't know about what you think about when you think about Christianity, but you need to know at its core, Christianity is not about self-help or even morality. It is divine rescue. So this is not about making bad people good. It's about making lost people found. At its core, Christianity isn't about self-help or morality, but divine rescue. And if you follow Jesus, you'll find healing. If you follow Jesus, he will lead you to hope. If you follow Jesus, he will lead you to experience everlasting joy. That is on the horizon. But we get so consumed with our own circumstances, get this, that we never look up. I'm here to tell you, got some good news for you today. I've read the end of the story. It's a spoiler alert. We win. We win in the end. We, 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 we win. Now, I know that there's pain going to be pain and it's difficulty now. And I know that you and I will both have life-wrecking days in our life, but we just need to keep our eyes up because in the end, we win. That God has promised to set everything right in the end. And if it's not right, it's not the end. If it's not good, he's not done. That's right. And so if you showed up this Easter just hoping for a quick fix, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you need to know from the very beginning, Jesus followers have never believed in a God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. Because in the beginning, Christianity was a resurrection religion. So that means that they watched as Jesus, their friend, was betrayed by another one of their friends. They watched as Jesus, their rabbi, was unjustly arrested. They watched as Jesus, their leader, was illegally tried and convicted. They watched as Jesus, their Messiah, was brutally flogged. And they saw with their very own eyes the very worst thing imaginable happen to the greatest person they had ever known, that Jesus, their Savior, was crucified and he died. Jesus followers had never believed in a God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. But what we celebrate when we celebrate Easter is that God still does his deepest work in our darkest hours. In fact, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, they show up on the other side of the resurrection saying we believed and then we didn't believe and now we believe again. Not because we finally understood what Jesus taught, And not because we we fully understand everything about the Bible. No, no, no. We believe because we saw a resurrected Jesus. That's why no matter how bad you've seen Christians be in our culture, I think you should give Jesus another chance. I think you should give Jesus another glance, right? Because, Because of who he is and what he did. In fact, in the book of Acts alone, they were seen by other 500 other witnesses. So if you're on the edges of faith, you need to know that the resurrection, nothing else, The resurrection is the foundation of our faith. This is not a gospel of morality. It's a gospel of transformation because these men who recorded their actions in history say, hey guys, sorry to tell you, but we were cowards and unbelievers. But on the other side of the resurrection, they had transformed lives. History records that these very same men who say we were cowards before the resurrections were willing to die a martyr's death on the other side of the resurrection. They were willing to die not for what they believe. People die for what they believe all the time and they're wrong. They die for what they believe they had seen, a resurrected Jesus. The resurrection changes everything. Why? Because no matter what you're facing, the resurrection gave them confidence that Jesus could actually get them to where they ultimately wanted to go. And that transformed their hearts. It transformed their lives. The resurrection is actually proof that everything else that Jesus claimed was true. The resurrection is proof that life can flow from dead places. The resurrection is proof that hope can come from hopeless situations. The resurrection is proof that love does conquer all sin. The resurrection is proof that God can keep all of his promises, that God can make everything right in the end. And if it's not right, it's not the end. The resurrection gave them confidence that Jesus could get them to where they ultimately wanted to go. And so that first Easter, they came carrying the spices to embalm the body of their dead friend, but they left carrying the name of the risen Jesus because he lives. They they left their fear at the tomb. Because he lives, they left their guilt at the tomb. Because he lives, they left all of the pain and the junk in their life at the tomb and they picked up a hope and they picked up a future. So that day they got to let go of their brokenness and they got to pick up the name of Jesus. 
And history records that those first followers of Jesus, carrying the name of Jesus, they increased by the hundreds and they increased by the thousands. And their boldness had nothing to do with fully understanding everything about the Bible, a comprehensive theology. Their boldness wasn't about the hope of heaven or their boldness was not about avoiding hell. Their boldness was about a single event, the epicenter of everything you and I believe as Jesus followers. Their boldness centered on one phrase, he has risen. That was their boldness. The foundation of our faith is the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. So I don't know what version of Christianity that you might have been sold growing up. But I'm here to tell you that in the beginning, Christianity is not, was not a fragile belief system. Following Jesus was never for weak people. That in the beginning, people didn't bail on Christianity because they disagreed with some of Jesus' teaching. People didn't bail on Christianity because they had negative inter- interactions with other Christians, right? No, they stayed on mission and Jesus' church grew, not because of a comprehensive belief system, but because they were willing to surrender their lives and live out their faith, right? Because they encountered a resurrected Jesus. Those first followers of Jesus became hopeful and fearless. Why? Because their savior beat death. The resurrection gave them confidence. Okay, he beat death. No matter what I face, no matter what difficulty, no matter what darkness, he can still lead me to where I ultimately want to go. And God had promised to set everything right in the end. If it's not right, it's not the end. So they had their eyes on the horizon of eternity. And I'm telling you, it transformed their lives. It wasn't about morality. It transformed their lives. And not just their lives. It transformed our world that you and I live in today. In fact, one of the most amazing untold stories of history is that the early church, those first followers of Jesus actually believed that they had access to eternal life. And because they believed that they had access to eternal life, they did not fear what? Death. So plagues would come in and wipe out entire towns and everyone else in the culture ran away. Not the Jesus followers, they would stay back and they would care for the sick and they would take care of the poor. They would care for their friends and their neighbors and the, because the grace of Jesus hit their lives so hard, they would stay and die because that's how much their savior loved them. I'm telling you, it was that kind of generosity and compassion that changed our world. And throughout history, there's always been a remnant of Jesus followers that have been the most progressive, sacrificial, compassionate, innovative, loving, generous people in the entire world. You need to know that the idea like God is love or everyone matters to God, these are uniquely Christian ideas that was introduced to the world by Jesus. The culture did not love, and the, God, the Greek and Roman gods didn't love anybody. They toyed with people. They didn't care about people and they didn't require their followers to either. When the whole world would look at sick or hungry or innocent or vulnerable people, they thought, oh, they're just being punished by God. They thought that they were cursed. They thought that they were getting what they deserved. But Jesus, what did he do? Well, he healed the sick. He would feed the hungry. He would love the unlovable. I'm telling you what Jesus introduced was brand new. And I, I love it. This, this Easter, I, you can still be skeptical of what we celebrate when we celebrate Easter. But Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, would be able to raise his hand and say, me, me too. In fact, John chapter 20, verse 24 says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of, I like to call him T. Diddy, was one of the 12, was not, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not, what? Believe. Guys, this is one of the original 12. And then scripture says that later that week, then he, Jesus, said to Thomas and he meets his specific request. He says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and what? Believe. And Thomas encountered Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, because you have your eyes on me, you have believed. Now, you know what scripture says is the opposite of faith? Sight. Thomas didn't have any faith. And in that moment, Jesus could have said a lot of things. He could have said, hey, Thomas, from now on, we're going to call you doubting Thomas. He didn't say that. He could have said, boys, I'm hungry. Let's go get something to eat. But Jesus, our Savior, you know what he did? He had you in mind. He said, blessed are those Blessed are those who have not seen and yet what? He talks about you. 
He talks about us. Why? Because from the very beginning, this whole thing was about a divine rescue. So I don't know maybe what you're carrying with you this Easter. I don't know what concern might be overwhelming in your life, but I just have to ask, can your version of Jesus actually save you? Is your version of Jesus strong enough to raise the dead and restore a family? Is your version of Jesus strong enough to erase all of the anxiety about all of your future? Is your version of Jesus strong enough to change your standing with God that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your hurt, your habit, your hang up. He sees a son of the most high king. He sees a precious daughter of the master of the universe, right? He so loves you. Can your version of Jesus save you? Because if your version of Jesus isn't strong enough to do all of that, you're not worshiping the true Jesus He is strong enough to give us joy for today and hope for tomorrow. Get this, he's not concerned about a more moral version of you. He wants a transformed version of you. He wants to transform your mind. He wants to transform your heart and he can transform your whole life. Now, don't get me wrong. We have this in common, you and I. We will both have terrible, heart-wrecking days in our life. But Jesus' followers have never believed in a God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. No, they had their eyes set on eternity. And so when the darkness comes, let me just ask, where are you placing your hope? I mean, I don't know what brand of Christianity that you believed in, but you need to know that because of the resurrection, those first followers of Jesus were absolutely fearless because when you don't fear death, what is there to fear? The resurrection gave them confidence that Jesus could get them to where they ultimately wanted to go. And so that means that if you follow Jesus, we believe that only God gets the final word of our life story. So it means no matter what you face, only God gets the final word in your life story. Nobody else, nothing else, right? No parent, no spouse, no coach, no relationship, no teacher, no enemy, no boss, no death, no pain, no loss, no circumstance in your life has the ability to have the final word in your life story, only God. Amen. So that means in the darkest part of your life, when we can go to God and we can trust God and you and I can follow God and we can face anything because we've gotten to the place where we know and we believe and we trust only God gets the final word in our life story. Let me just ask, where are your eyes? Where are your eyes? When the trouble comes, where are your eyes? Can can it be that we get so consumed that you've forgotten about your hope, that we get tunnel vision on all of our problems? Could it be that we're so consumed by our own personal grief that we've settled for a powerless version of Christianity? Where are your eyes? Now, if you're skeptical about God because of the pain and the heartbreak you see in this world, I want you to know today that God agrees with you. He agrees with you. In fact, he reminds those first followers of Jesus this simple phrase, this world is not your home. But follow me and I'll lead you to joy. Follow me and I'll lead you to peace. Follow me and I will take you where you ultimately need to go. This is a divine rescue. And so even if your dad abandoned you, And even if your bank account is empty, and even if your wife gave up on you and your best friend betrayed you, and even if you just received hopeless medical news and the whole world feels like the whole, feels like the whole world hates you, get this, that's okay. Because this world is not your home. This is not the end of your life story. This world's not your home. So Jesus came to defeat death and anxiety and, and came to defeat hopelessness and he came to lead you and I to true joy and everlasting life. This world is not your home. And so how do we recover when life gets dark? Well, I think it all depends on where you place your your joy. The Oxford Dictionary says that joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. That's what America thinks when they think of joy. It's about a feeling. And so often you and I, we place our joy in our plans or in our relationships or in our feelings. But the Greek word for joy is all about the source. In fact, the the writer of Hebrews shares with us that on the cross, Jesus had joy. And from the very beginning, just because people followed God didn't mean that they didn't struggle. So those first followers of Jesus, they, they lived in the face of darkness and difficulty. But the writer of Hebrews challenges them and us to let us run this, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. 
So we get tunnel vision. We're too focused in the moment. He says to fix your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on the horizon. And he says the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And then he says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's the source. What's the joy? What was the source? Jesus saw us with him forever and eternity. The joy set before him when Jesus died on the cross was you. That's what he saw. He saw you on the cross. That to him, that was worth dying for. That's why he stayed on the cross. So that first Easter, those first followers of Jesus were devastated, but they just had their eyes on the wrong place. They just need to look up because Jesus saw us with him forever and eternity. And from the beginning, Jesus links our joy with eternity. And so how do you and I recover when life gets dark? When we let that joy, eternal joy, become our joy. This world is not your home. You're just passing through. It'll go like that. It can be overwhelming and you will experience consuming anxiety, but God does his deepest work in our darkest hours. So let me just ask, why would you place your joy or your hope in anything or anyone that will fail you? Lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes. This Easter, you can say the joy set before me is anchored to eternity. I'm only here for a moment. This world's not my home. My healing is on the horizon. Heaven is on the horizon. Joy is on the horizon because the joy set before me, oh, that's anchored to eternity. Because Easter is the declaration of war against everything in your life that you think God can't fix. Everything in your life that you think is gonna keep you from experiencing the loving forgiveness of your Savior. Easter's about saying, Jesus, I'm gonna put down everything that I've been carrying, all of my hurts and habits and hangups and shin, sin and shame, that was close, and hopes and dreams. I'm gonna put all that down. I'm gonna pick up Jesus. Claim to God, I've seen you heal before. I've seen you forgive before. I've seen you restore before. I've seen you bring dead things to life before. And I'm just gonna trust and believe and have my eyes fixed on the fact that you can do it again. Today, you may have walked in here carrying a burden, but you can leave carrying a promise. You can leave carrying some hope. You can leave carrying the very name of Jesus over your life. I'm telling you, the event of Easter changes everything. All of human history leads up to it and all eternity leads out of it. He has risen and with him, so did our future. Easter is the perfect day for anyone on the edges of faith to take a step forward for the one who died for you in place of you, who get this is powerful enough to do everything, work everything in your life for your good and his glory. And so the challenge for Easter is maybe for simply for you, would you accept his love in the waters of baptism today? Would you be willing to lay down this life for eternal life? And if that's you, as soon as this service is over, just meet me in the next steps room. We can talk about that. Or maybe you're a Jesus follower. And I just want to challenge you as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion. That's what we're doing next. If you have that, hopefully you have that. But what, if, what if, what if you actually still believe that God can do his deepest work in our darkest hours? What if you actually believe that? See, I'll admit too often I get tunnel vision, but we can have confidence today and hope for tomorrow because communion is a reminder that realigns our heart to realize the price has already been paid for you to know just how much God loves you. In fact, 700 years before crucifixion was even invented, the Isaiah the prophet wrote this, he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. He says, all of us, all of us like sheep have been strayed away uh, and we have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And by his wounds, we're reminded of his love. By his wounds, we're reminded that there is hope. And by his wounds, you and I can be healed. I'm telling you, if it's not good, he's not done. Would you pray with me? Father, just thank you so much that we get to celebrate today because you beat death. Not only that, but because of that, we can have life and hope and a future. Father, help us to have confidence in the fact that your victory can be our victory today. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you have experienced here today to stir something in your life and lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking on the button that's popping up on your screen now. Here at Victory, we are contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity and the work God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.life slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church, we are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time. Thank you.